This is a 1934 Pierce Arrow 836A. Pierce Arrow made cars for, I don't know, about 20, 30 years, um, ending in 38, I believe. Um, this particular car uh, was, was known to be the uh, cheaper version of the Pierce Arrows. Uh, Pierce Arrow, if you didn't know, was built in Buffalo, New York. Um, competed with Packards, Lincolns, Cadillacs. Uh, was known to be a very stately car. Uh, I acquired this car at an auction in upstate New York uh, where a gentleman had acquired 20 or 200 or 300 cars and um, I'd always wanted a pre-war car to do an electric conversion in but I didn't want the normal Chevy or Ford or Dodge. Um, so found this, uh, fit the bill, and I am going to be converting this to a Tesla Model 3 drivetrain um, with Tesla battery, uh, with a um, coil over front suspension as well. So the outside of the car is going to remain as you see it, obviously finished. Um, I have most of the parts that I need to finish it. I just have disassembled it to, uh, to start working on it. Um, I'll show you what the inside looks like for those of you who have never seen the undercarriage of a 30s car. This wood in here is ash, uh, which was used in most pre-war cars as the structure that uh, even up in here, everything, all the inner structure is all in ash and then they clad the outside of it in steel. Um, you can see down some of these areas here um, that aren't rusted are most likely lead underneath because um, that's what they used back then instead of polyester body filler. You can see right here in, in that, this uh, it's not magnetic there because it's, it's lead. So this car, I don't know much history about it other than the fact that it uh, was at an auction. It had been taken apart, uh, no drivetrain in it. Uh, the value of this is probably forty to $60,000 completely restored. To restore this car um, would probably cost me upwards of a couple hundred thousand. Um, to get all the original parts, chrome, whatnot. So I thought, you know, get the car back on the road, you know, do do uh, do the body some justice to get it back on the road in the condition it's in. Don't modify it. Don't hot rod the body, um, but also make it modern and drivable. So this, uh, pardon my shaking, this is a 2020. Model 3 rear drivetrain unit. And I got this out of a auction in Georgia. The guy parts these out. And obviously, as you know, Tesla units are, uh, Tesla cars are very wide. Model S is a very wide car uh, as far as the industry goes. So, the Pierce Arrow, um, which is this is something I, I struggled with finding, so I'll share with all of you guys. Uh, the piece Pierce Arrow is 61 inches, 61 inches hub to hub to the outside to the mounting surface of the wheel. The Tesla Model 3 doesn't matter if it's performance, long range, short range, all the same. Um, is 65 and an eighth hub to hub. Um, so obviously. It's not, this, this conversion is gonna be very difficult in a uh, car that's pre-war, many things, yeah, anything pre, probably 50 is gonna be very difficult. You'll have to shorten it uh, once you get into a, a full like muscle car version, you know, late, late 60s, 70s, obviously those cars are a little wider. Um, but most people wanna go with the Model S drivetrain there because they want horsepower. I'm not looking for horsepower, I'm looking for something that's different, um, a challenge to build, uh, quiet, uh, very comfortable to drive. 
So let me take you over here to sort of where I where I started. I built this cradle to mirror exactly how the Model 3 sits with the stock ride height. So these mounting points are exactly the ride height of a Model 3. Because I wanted to mirror, I wanted to start with Tesla's, Tesla's engineering. So you can see here and here, these are all stock ride heights. Obviously with a Pierce Arrow, I am going to be using these style wheels, which are significantly taller, uh, and an eighth inch or a 65 and a quarter inch track width, hub to hub, going into a car that's 61 inch. Um, it's, you know, I obviously we're going to have interference with the fender. Um, it's not, even if I didn't have interference, the offset of the wheel wouldn't look right. Um, so narrowing this is sort of a necessity. Um, as most of you, if you're watching this, probably understand if you're, if you've gotten this far into looking at this project. So what I've done here is that I'm going to cut these welds off. This is the motor frame. This mo this, this is where these A arms connect. It's all in one unit. Um, now these A arms, I don't need to have a spring cup because I'm going to use a coilover. So this will probably be changed into a plate um, with some reinforcement for a coilover mount. Um, but for the sake of not re-engineering something that a Tesla engineer has done and they're way smarter than me, I'm going to keep the arms the way they are. So I'm going to cut these off uh, on my on my um, mount uh, my cradle. I'm going to recreate exactly where this mount is supposed to go so it stays static when I cut these off so I know. Um, same over here, you can see, uh, roll, this, roll this out of the way, um, you can see this mount, I'm taking two inches on each side so there's plenty, of, there, there's probably inch and three quarter here so I'll have to notch that a little bit but nothing major. Recreates the mounts. Um, probably a little bit thicker material because I won't be having all these bends in it for strength. Um, uh, probably will have some bends, but just not as many there. And then the big compensation is for the plugs. So you have this high voltage plug here. You have two inches here, but obviously I won't be able to unplug it. So I'm going to do a relief here. Um, over on this side, your engine coolant. Uh, obviously here I have about an inch so I'm gonna cut this back plate that back reinforce it probably the biggest corner is this corner here uh, motor controller or one plug for the motor controller I'll have to notch this back and then if we go to the other side you'll see this is the big uh, concern and really not a concern just you know, this is gonna be most of the work like about three quarters half half to five eighths probably here so these mounts will have to go away um, have to recreate them on the inside over on this side um, and then this whole thing will have to be notched back and probably re-engineered um, like I said before this mount actually is going to come out over here so I'm not concerned about this, so I'll probably end up restructuring this whole corner for the most part. Um, looks like they're using maybe 14 gauge steel here. Um, I'll probably use something similar, just a touch, touch bigger. Um, as like any, any project, it gives you the opportunity to buy a new tool. So I bought this, uh, Sort of part in the bike, so I have a couple kids, and as you know, uh, when you have kids, they sort of take over your garage. Uh, went and bought this bend press from Trick Tools. I've wanted the press for a while, or, or a, a, a brake. Um, 
thought, and they just came out with this. It's, uh, I think it's going to do well for what I need because it, it'll bend heavier, heavier gauge material. This jet um, also got this from Trick Tools. This this sanding attachment is absolutely awesome. If you've never had one, um, just an awesome attachment. So that's where we're at so far. Um, I th as you can tell, I got one axle out. I was just screwing around with it yesterday. Pulled the axle out. This axle, actually, I got to pull um, this coolant, uh, this cooler off of it, um, which I think they use the reverse Torx, which is sort of a pain in the ass. I think Tesla's known for that, so I don't have this size. I have this size over here, which is E14. You have to take this mount off to get this coolant hose out, but if you wanted to do that, I, you don't need to take this coolant hose off because obviously this is the mount. So I just left that coolant hose on. I took this one off because it's much longer and it's, it's in the way. Um, so the next step is to pull the uh, coolant uh, module off or I don't know, the, the cooler, uh, take the axle out and then eventually get it mounted up, well, grind my table there because it's a little bit dirty from some work I've been doing. But uh, pull this table out, get it put it over here, get everything fixed to it, and then start uh, start cutting. Um, the one thing is gonna be helpful for those of you doing this, I don't have a engine hoist or a um, chain full or, or chain hoist, whatever you wanna call it. That would certainly be helpful. That motor is not light. Um, I'm guessing this whole rear unit is probably six to 800 pounds. Um, so just keep in mind. Now I will say that the rear unit that I came out of this Pierce with cast iron was absolutely, you know, crazy, crazy heavy. So I'd be interested to see once I get it mounted in there, what the four corner weighting is. Um, as you can tell, I have, the motor will come up to about here. And then the, the batteries will be down in here. Up in here, this frame is actually about 10 inches tall. They built these cars like tanks. Um, obviously you can see it's somewhat boxed. I'll box it the back here as well. Um, just for, just because, um, I'll have to take that supporting member out of, that's a transmission holder, which, or transmission mount, which, um, it's rivet, hot riveted on, or actually, no, that's bolted on. There was another, there was another mount here that was hot riveted on. I took off cause I knew it was going to be interfering with the battery. So I think, I think I'll be able to, the batteries will end in front of the firewall. They'll come back. Um, I'll have to expend the bottom of the frame rail to the same height as it is up here all the way back, um, which shouldn't be a major ordeal. Um, but yeah, ironically, this is a big enough car and a big enough frame that I think the batteries will fit in nicely. Um, it's... Obviously, as you can tell now, by back then, it's coilover suspension, or uh, a leaf spring suspension, solid axle. Um, leaf springs are wrapped in aluminum, uh, which ironically, or, you know, it, it makes sense because Pierce had a relationship with Alcoa aluminum back, back in those days. So they did have some aluminum bodied cars. Uh, but yeah, they've they've used some aluminum in their bodies um, and and their chassis, uh, different from other companies because they had that relationship. So I'll sign off for now, and uh, pardon me, my first video. I just think it's worth uh, sharing with some of you guys what uh, what I'm doing, what I've uncovered, some of the information that I've gathered that I thought was a little bit difficult to gather, and um, please leave a message. Uh, I'll try to answer as much as I can based on what I've heard. Um, and for those of you who maybe saw, this is my other 
my other project that I, well, it's not really a project anymore, it's totally running. It's a 56 Packard, uh, last year Packard made Packards before they were bought by Studebaker. Um, won't go into too much detail, but for those of you who like electronics, this has electronic push button shifting, which was the only company that have that. Um, all the other push button shifting was done with vacuum. And then this also has electronic suspension, torsion level electronic suspension that uh, if you push on any part of the car, there's no springs on it, it the car will re-level automatically. And that was back in 56. Uh, so Packard was way ahead of their time back in those days. See you later. Thanks for watching. Bye.